You know, as I was thinking today, I began to meditate upon a certain passage in the Bible that's become most popular with Bible haters. Now, how in the world can one passage, one scripture in the Bible, become such a loved saying, a well, broad, accepted saying among those that actually hate the Bible who are enemies of the Bible? See, Romans 1, I believe it's verses um, 24, said they hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they grab the Bible, they hold the Word of God, and they declare certain passages that they particularly pick out, ones that they say may support their cause, but yet, as 2 Timothy 2.15 declares, we're to study the Word of Truth, Study to show ourselves approved, a workman unto God, not need be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's 2 Timothy 2.15. A student of the word, don't just take one scripture from the Bible, one little passage, and build a whole doctrine around it uh, to support their cause, so to speak. But according to the book of Romans, chapter 1, the Bible declares, make sure I got that right, because I don't want to be quoting wrong. Verses 18, I said it was verse 24, but Romans 1, 18 says they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Again, that means they grab the Bible and they just quote and throw out a scripture here, a scripture there to support their deception. Jesus did this in Matthew 4 when he was tempting Jesus to jump off the top of the pinnacle. He quoted Psalms 91 and 11 and said as he tried to convince and deceive Jesus, which was dumb to begin with <laughs> he, he, he told him he said go ahead and leap off this tall pinnacle and kill you say or, or, or in an attempt to, to end your life he said did not the scripture say the angels would bear thee up in their hands lest you dash your foot against the stone that's Psalms 91 verses 11 in other words Satan took one scripture out of context to proclaim his deception the devil knows the word too and these Bible haters one of their most famous passages that they love to proclaim to us followers of Christ who, according to Jude verses 3, contend for the faith. That's right. Faith in God is not just something we believe. It's what we contend for, we fight for. First Timothy 6 and 12 says, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Friend, if your faith in God does not never call you to an action to contend for that faith, to publicly stand up for what you privately believe, well then you don't even privately believe what you say you do. Privately. Private faith has to become a public faith. There comes a time when what you believe is not just something you keep to yourself. Though you have the faith, you share it. You don't keep it to yourself. You have to, you have to make a stand for it. That's why 1 Corinthians one twenty four said we stand by faith. And again, Jude verse 3 said, we contend for the faith that was once delivered unto us as saints. Contend means we fight for it. We wrestle for it. Hallelujah. We stand up for it. We stand against anything that comes against it. We fight for the faith. So if you don't never fight for the faith, the chances are your faith, yeah, I'm about to say it, is merely just faith in faith and not faith in God. All right, so they hold the truth in unrighteousness. We've established that, Romans 1, verse 18. That means they take the word of God, and in unrighteousness, in sin, they proclaim it to be what they want it to be, rather than what it's actually teaching and saying. And here's the famous scripture, again, preached and proclaimed among all Bible haters. And they preach it, to the choir, so to speak. They, they declare it back to the church and they throw it in our face every time we try to stand for the faith. Every time we try to stand against sin, such as abortion, homosexual marriage, against any type of sin, fornication, whatever it may be, sexual impurities, whatever it may be, gossip. Come on, we, we could just go on with the list. Witchcraft, the occult, I mean, uh, alcohol abuse, uh, on and on and on and on and on, etc., when we come against sin, all of a sudden, the sinner, the Bible hater, claims and can quote only one scripture. 
Matthew 7 verse 1, they proclaim, judge not that ye be not judged. Yes, sir. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Matthew 7 verses 1, a scripture with seven words. Judge not that ye be not judged. They declare to us in their deception as they hold the word of God, Matthew 7 and 1, the truth in unrighteousness. Now they don't know what verses 2, verse 3, 4, and 5 declares. No, all they know is verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, lest you be judged. Do you realize Matthew 7 verses 1 is a scripture of judgment? Do you realize when you quote Matthew 7 verse 1, you're actually judging the person you declare it to because you're telling them as you warn them, judge not, lest ye be judged. Do you see the judgment of that scripture? Friend, even that scripture is a judgment passage. That's right. Just for example, John 3.16 is not just a love passage. It's also, amen, a warning about hell. It's a passage of judgment. Yes, it is. Listen to it. And it's a famous quote here too. And a lot of people love to quote this one, but they miss the judgment of John 3.16. For example, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, here it is, should not perish, but have everlasting life. God speaks how he loved this world so much that he gave his best, Jesus Christ, on that Roman crucified, amen, cross. Glory to God, shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And here, here's why. So we should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know that God, before he ever mentions everlasting life or heaven, in John 3, 16, he said, should not perish. Perish causes us to be reflected upon eternity, not in heaven, but in hell. Because in hell, people perish. So Jesus said, I love you so much, I give my life on the cross for you so you wouldn't have to go to hell. So you could have everlasting life. But since when have you heard a preacher preach on the hell of John 3.16? Do you understand what I'm trying to declare here today? A lot of people miss the judgment in scriptures. In Psalms chapter 119, 165, God said, Thy truth, or thy word, is truth from the beginning. All thy righteous judgments, he said, are the truth from the beginning. God's word is judgment. His words are righteous judgments. Righteous decisions. The word decision causes us to reflect on the word judgment. Even in scripture, God in the Old Covenant and Old Testament has a book in the Bible called the book of Judges. God's not against judging. Matter of fact, he said in 1 Corinthians 6 and verses 2, he said, do you not even know that the saints shall judge the world? Wow, that's 1 Corinthians 6 and 2. You ought to read that, you Bible hater. Amen, in your Bible. In verses 3 of 1 Corinthians 6, the Bible goes on and says, And ye shall, talk, he's talking about the saints, the Christians, ye shall even judge angels. Wow, that's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2 and 3. What we're going to do with 1 Corinthians 2, 15, where God says, he says, The spiritual shall judge all things. Wow. God says, Here, here's how you sh see if you're really spiritual. You judge all things. You judge. Judge means to see clearly. It means to discern between right and wrong, left and right, black and white, sin and unrighteousness, and righteousness and holiness. Hallelujah. So you discern between good and evil. You discern between what is of God and what is not of God. And again, the word discern means to judge. God's word is righteous judgments. He even said in Matthew 7 and 20, you shall know them. The word know means you shall judge or discern them by their fruits. You shall know them to see clearly. That is what judge means, to open the eye, to see clearly, to discern between right and wrong, left and right, good and evil, you understand, etc. So judgment is not a subject in scripture that God completely eradicates. He said the saints are going to judge the world, they're going to judge angels, and he said those that are spiritual mean they're filled with the Holy Ghost, they have discernment, they're able to judge. Even Hebrews 4.12 says for the word of God's quick, and by the way, that don't mean hurry up and get through preacher that's preaching it, it means the ability to revive something that's dead. The word of God's quick, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the sunder of the soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and listen to this, is a discerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart. The word of God is words of judgment. They're God's 
final decision. God's word comes forth like a sword. It cuts in with conviction and it cuts out with healing. Praise God. Hallelujah. And he said, it is a discerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart. You cannot really get into this book and this book get into you and you walk around with a no judgment mentality. It will cause you to see the fruit. You'll see people say one thing, but you'll see the way they live, and immediately the discernment from this book, which is a book of judgments, will come up in your spirit and say, that ain't right. Hallelujah. Titus 1 16 said they profess with their mouth to know God, but in their works, their lifestyle, they deny him. That's Titus 1 16. Paul was preaching to a brother named Titus and he said, Titus, you're going to meet people in the church world. They say with their mouth they love Jesus. He said, but then they live contrary to the way Jesus would have lived. Their works, their deeds openly, their fruit proclaims that they're hypocrites. They say one thing with their mouth and do something else with their life lifestyle, their actions. Because faith without works is dead, James 2 and verses 20. In James 2, 22, James said, the brother of Jesus said, some have said, I'll show you my faith without works. He said, but I'll show you my faith by my works. Friend, if your faith is not shown by your lifestyle, the way you outwardly live, well, your faith is counterfeit. And hear the word of the Lord, James 2, 19 said, devils also believe and tremble. Demon spirits believe in God, even tremble but they do not follow after the God they believe in. And friend, if you believe in a God, you will not follow and surrender your life to and live therefore like he would have you to live according to what his scripture outlines uh, as a way of life. Uh, my friend, you have a demon's faith. You have a satanic faith. That's right, a satanic faith is to confess and believe with your mouth, uh, but yet don't live and walk out what you say you believe. Hear the Holy Ghost. Jesus said in John 11 and verse 26, He that liveth and believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Do, again, believest thou this? Jesus posed the question, Do you believe like this? Sad to say in modern Christendom, many don't believe that way no more. But Jesus said, This is my definition of faith. You live what you believe. He said, He that liveth and believeth shall have everlasting life. So, so here, Matthew 7 and 1, let's break this thing down. Glory to God. This is the most favorite scripture. Judge not that you be not judged. Matthew 7 and 1. Seven words in one passage that these Bible haters love to proclaim. But let's go on and see what the story is really about. Verses 2 said, For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with the measure ye meet, or measure, it shall be measured unto you again. That's pretty clear. All right, let's see what verse 3 says. And why beholdest thou the moat? that is in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that's in your own eye. Now, God is asking a particular person this question that he has just said, don't you judge lest you be judged, because the measure you judge with, you're going to be judged back, buddy. This is Jesus talking. This is written in red. Now, who is he talking to? Well, he must have been talking to a brother because he said, or a Christian, he said, because why do you behold the moat, which is a log, in your brother's eye, but you don't even consider the beam that's in your own eye. A beam would be a pure out big old hallelujah big tree, not some little speck or a little log like I just mentioned. Or maybe I shouldn't use log. Maybe I should use stick. Uh, and in other words, he said, why are you trying to, to help your brother get the stick out of his eye when you got a big old tree, a big old log hanging out your eye? So listen what Jesus says in verse 4. Or how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull the moat or the stick out of your eye, and behold, a beam or a big old log of tree is in your own eye? Jesus is asking this question. Listen what he said. Thou hypocrite. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam or the big log of the tree out of your own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly. And remember, the word judgment means to discern, which causes us to know the word clearly see. Right here, the word judge means to see. He said, then shall you be able to clearly see or judge to cast out the moat or the little stick out of your brother's eye. 
So Jesus here is talking to people who say they follow God, but yet he refers to them as hypocrites because he's asking them a question. He's not telling them they can't be critical. He just says, I refuse you to be hypocritical. I don't refuse you to judge. I just don't, re I refuse you to judge or try to discern somebody else's spiritual life where they're at with me. And when you got something going on in your own life, in other words, if you point your finger at me and you see some speck or some, some, some stick in my life, some small sin in my life, but yet when you look into the mirror of his word, that's the perfect law of his liberty and reflecting back in your face is some big old log in your eye. God says, first, get that big old log, you hypocrite, out of your eye. Then you can go help your brother see clearly to help him get the stick, the small one, out of his eye. So Jesus here was not refuting the message of judgment. He was saying to hypocrites, those who were living in sin, trying to tell somebody else they're living in sin and telling them they ought to repent of their sin when they got sin in their own life. Hallelujah. So God here was not referring to those that's been washed in the blood, who's been sanctified from their sin. My friend, if I'm not living in sin, I got all rights, according to this book, to point my finger and declare with the love of God in my heart and concern in my soul for those that are hearing turn from your sin lest you perish in hell forever hallelujah and in doing so I'm not guilty of coming and judging you inaccurately I'm not guilty of doing some judgment sin so to speak hallelujah and you may call me critical for doing this as a preacher and as other preachers do it as well friend we're not stopped from being critical or judging or discerning righteousness God said in John 7 and 24, Jesus, it's written in red, judge with righteous judgment. Friend, there is a permission from God to judge, to discern, to see clearly, to know what's right and wrong righteously, to judge righteously. Hallelujah. And here it is. If I'm telling you that's wrong, well, then I better have that what's wrong, not in my life, or I'm going to be in trouble with God. Hello? Hello? So when you point your finger and tell somebody that's wrong, you need to get that out of your life, and you're doing the same thing and worse, that's when Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged, you hypocrite. But my God... <laughs> when you've been washed in the blood and it don't mean you're holier than thou it don't mean my God you're better than somebody else but eternally let's be real you are in a better condition than they are but it causes you not to become haughty and pious and full of pride like hey I'm saved and you ain't no it means there's a concern in your soul and you love them so much you gotta tell them the truth they're your brother they're your sister and you see them doing wrong and you have to warn them lest their blood be on your hands. Paul even declared in Acts chapter 20 and verses 26, he said, I take record this day that my hands are pure from the blood of all men. Hallelujah. So when those Bible haters come along, saying of God, and when you're declaring righteousness and you're discerning clearly between what's right and wrong, what's righteous and unrighteous, and you proclaim it, and they point at you and quote Matthew 7 and 1 and says, Judge not lest you be judged. Look back at them and say, You just judged me, you hypocrite. Why would you take a passage of judgment to throw at me and tell me I couldn't judge? No. The saints shall judge the world, 1 Corinthians 6 and 2. The spirits shall judge all things, 1 Corinthians 2.15. Judge means to discern between right and wrong. Hello? And my friend, this book is a book of judgments and it tells you what's right. It tells you what's wrong. Don't believe those that hold the word of righteous or the word of truth and unrighteousness, Romans 1.18. They misquote, they misuse the scripture, especially Matthew 7 and 1, for their own deceptive benefits. Because they get under conviction when preachers or saints declare what's right and what's wrong according to what this book says and they stand up and contend for the faith. Then all of a sudden they're called mean-spirited and they're accused of judging. Well, you have accurately accused us right. We are judges. I done quoted them and I ain't got to repeat them. We've quoted it over and over and over. God does not cancel out the saints being able to judge. 
What he refuses is for somebody to say they love Jesus and they're following him to tell somebody else to get out of their sin and they themselves hadn't repented of their sin. That's what Matthew 7, 1 through 5 is about. And for the rest of you that get offended at this message and don't agree with nothing I've said because I know some of you by the Spirit of God I can see into the future by the Holy Ghost right now. You're going to watch this and you're getting so hot and fired up and you're digging through your Bible while I'm preaching right here because you want to say something back at me and text me or do something to try to prove that I'm wrong. So I just go ahead and give you a word right now so we can just uh, silence that thing right here and there. Verses 6 of Matthew 7, though I quoted 1 through 5, read from it rather. Verse 6 says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn again and rend you. So if you want to fight this, I'm not going to throw my pearl before you, you hog, <laughs> you swine. You got a you got a sickness, it's swine flu for sure, a spiritual swine flu. Hallelujah. I've just threw a pearl out there and you're planning on, you're prompting, you're premeditating trying to come and attack the pearl of truth I've just laid out there. You may think this is cocky, but this is confidence, my friend. You, you, you may think this is conceit, but my friend, this is conviction. You may think that I'm standing here in pride, but no, my friend, this is the precepts of the Lord coming forth today in righteousness. I hold the truth in righteousness. Hallelujah. And friend, if you're watching this and you're living in sin, and I've quoted a few, and I don't have to go into all the name calling, though sometimes we do. Friend, you know, you know there's stuff in your life that ain't right with God. And you still pretend and play around like it is. God says, repent and turn from that sin today because I'm coming soon. And friend, whether you want to believe it or not, you will stand before him as judge. So you better appreciate the preachers and the teachers and the saints who speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15, they love you so much they tell you the truth and they come before you and they witness to you, and they say, turn from your sin, you better accept the judgments of the saints, the judgment of the preachers that come to you like I'm coming to you today. Or one day you're going to stand before an eternal judge. And my friend, I'm telling you there, there'll be no high price lawyers to pay, the, the, to get you off the hook. No, my friend, only the blood of Jesus can prepare you for eternity. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all our sin. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7. So call on Him now. Maybe you're guilty of using Matthew 7 and 1 when you hear preachers preach or Christians talk and you've always quoted that back at them. Maybe you're living in sexual sin and you've heard someone recently, a Christian, quoting something or a preacher preaching something and it pricked your heart and instead of humbling yourself, you became hostile. You know, that's what you do when you hear truth and it pricks you, it convicts you, it opens your eyes, it judges you, it opens you, it shows you that you're wrong. You either humble yourself and repent, or you become hostile, and you begin to attack. And somebody today, you became hostile. You've said, I ain't going back to that church, I don't hear that preacher. Well, you've just fulfilled 2 Timothy 4, verses 3, where the Bible said, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. They'll turn from the truth and be turned to fables. My God, stop turning to fables, to bedtime stories. Turn to the faith. If the preacher standing at your pulpit never gets in your business and appears to be judging you, you better get out of that church. That ain't a church. That's a corpse, my friend. And the Holy Ghost is not directing that house. Hear the word of God. God loves you so much that he'll come through his saints. He'll come through his preachers. He'll judge you and say, let your eye open. See this is wrong. Turn from it. Hallelujah. Why? So you can stand before him in eternity, prepared and ready, having your robes washed white as snow in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7, verse 14. Hallelujah. Hope you've enjoyed this today. If you hadn't, you've endured it. But either way, praise God, naked truth coming to you. Hallelujah. From the office of Prophet Marvin Booth, that be me. Ma'am and sir, praise God. Hallelujah. Right here in my prayer study. Hallelujah. Amen. Coming to you today live, naked truth. Take it for what it is. This is a pearl from God. And if you are on set on continuing to be an old spiritual swine, a pig, 
and you're preparing and uh, to trample the pearl of truth I've just given out, don't even waste your time. Don't even waste your fingertips on your keyboard, whether it be on your iPhone or on your laptop computer. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because in judging me for what he just told me to say to you, you yourself will announce judgment, his, on your own self. So don't be a pig. Don't be a swine. Hallelujah. Praise God. Don't be as a dog. Don't trample on what it is God sent out. Be as a little lamb. Praise God and humble yourself and follow the great shepherd, Jesus. Jesus.